and welcome to this uh, first type of Tuba Mania webinar where we are going to have a live interactive masterclass with Maestro Roger Bobo. Uh, you all know me by now. I'm Steve Rosse, your host. I've been principal tuba player of the Sydney Symphony Orchestra for 31 years and I was a student of Mr. Roger Bobo. Welcome, Maestro. I did mute you, so you've got to unmute yourself. Make sure you're unmuted. How are you? How's everything in Mexico? Everything's fine. It's beautiful weather here, and it's comfortable. <laughs> that comfortable is the best temperature, isn't it? <laughs> See, yes. <laughs> well, we've got a lot of. Uh, I'm really glad to be a part. Of this. I'm really glad to be a part of this. I've been watching what you've been doing. It's incredible. Well, it's incredible. We it's incredible because we have people like you um, coming on, and and the attendees. We've got a, a lot of people from all over the world. Yuli is joining us again from Argentina. I'm just going to start here with a bit of a check in with all of our friends from all over the world because the thing I love about the most is this connection and this big hangout. We have like 173 people. Uh, so we've got June. Are you going to tell me 173 people? Yeah. I mean, you're reading the names of 173 people. Oh, I'm just going to say <laughs> hello to a few, a few representatives. So if I miss you, <laughs> sorry, but we've got uh, June here from Japan, uh, John Cradler uh, from Washington D.C., 
Um, Bob says he's got no sound, but everybody else can hear. Um, Valdo uh, is saying hello from Brazil. We've got Jesus from Spain, Takihiro from Japan, Steve Marcus in New York, uh, Dr. Buddy Clements says, howdy, Roger. Great to see you even on the web. Uh, Dave Topping from Seattle, Stan McDonald, Queensland, Australia. We've got um, Eric Fenstermacher, um, who's chiming from St. Louis. Yeah. There, you know, great, great YouTube stuff, man. Thanks, Derek, for all your inspiration and 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 stuff you're giving us. Um, anyway, the list goes on and on. We've got Doug Hubbard from Chico, California, who comes in um, every week. Um, just about Pat Lugo in Miami. So, uh, folks, I would ask you to maybe bear with a little bit of patience um, in case things don't go exactly as planned. Um, we have three students who will be playing live later on in Mr. Bobo's um, class on articulation um, and sound and other topics. Um, the way we're going to run this is Mr. Bobo will talk about articulation and language for a while. Then we will take a Q&A, and then he will go on to talk about multiple talking. And then we'll have a Q&A on that, and then we will bring the students on to work with him. And what I would like you to, to consider is ask Mr. not only um, how to help address issues that you might be having or challenges you might be having with your own playing, but work on your teaching skills. And this is how I learned. And I think, oh, I'll do this with the students. So um, Mr. Bobo, maestro, let's get started. Let's get started. OK. Let me give you the whole now and and tell us about articulation and language thank you <laughs> well you know let's talk first about singing and about brass playing there's a real correlation between the two things because the sound source is organic we're not playing on a string like a violin or a, a reed like an oboe but the vibration for us is here and the vibration for singers is this thing here. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> and uh, when I lived in Italy, I frequently played uh, a substitute for the Maggio Musicale Orchestra. That's the orchestra that is really the Florence Opera Company. And I was there one evening, I was playing the opera Tosca and Poverati was the singer. If you don't know who Pavarotti was, he's been the number one tenor in the world for quite a while. And I, I was listening to him. And I watched, I go in there and watch these great stars doing their equivalent to our warm up and how they get ready psychologically to perform. And Pavarotti was vocalizing. He was playing with one hand piano and, and singing. I wish I had a piano. And I was thrilled because that's an etude from my book. Okay. Now, of course, uh, that Pavarotti was playing mine. It was a big deal. But let's be serious about this. Why? Because voice is so much like brass playing of the organicness that brass players for the last two centuries have been taking pedagogical materials from the vocal world and making them part of brass instrument warm ups. So we stole that from Pavarotti, I think. I, somebody got it from Pavarotti and Schlossberg got it from that person and uh, Stamp got it from another person and I got it from Stamp and now it's in my book. So Pavarotti really wasn't doing my etudes. Articulation is the consonants of the musical language. And I wanted to talk about that a little bit. In language, the sound source, the larynx, comes first, 
And afterwards comes the articulation mechanism where we make all of our vowel sounds and all of our um, articulation sounds. And speaking, the larynx vibrates first and the consonants and the vowels come second. In playing, the consonants and the vowels, the tone quality and the articulation comes first and then the sound. And in that way, it's not as versatile as the voice. The voice is so great that there's so many possibilities, infinite possibilities, that we can develop language and communicate on that level. In brass playing, we communicate on the musical level. But there are, in languages, about a, a hundred and 20 down to 110 100 vibrations 100 consonants to choose from now we can't use all of those in brass playing but we can use what we call plosives and plosives etymologically comes from the word explosion plosives explosion and that's the our old favorite articulation ta that's the default way we've all learned how to play on a ta but that can come in very different varieties now the vowels are tone quality and there's so many different vowels in languages that we can't demonstrate them all we have a a e o Ooh. And then we have all the hybrids. Ah, er, e, ah, ni. When you're sitting home and you don't have anything to do in this time of the year, in this situation, the people have that. See how many vowel sounds you can make. Now, it's very interesting to see what language sounds like without consonants. And first of all, if you write down a sentence or a paragraph, experiment this with this at home. Write it down and leave out the vowels. Just write down the consonants and look at it. And you can, you can tell probably what it is. But if you write it down and only put the vowels, you can't anyway tell what it is. It's very important, especially for we tubists that these consonants or these articulations be very clear because the human ear doesn't hear that clearly in the lower register. But I want to show you what does it sound like when we leave out the consonants. It'll either sound like I'm drunk, which I'm not, or that I am uh, intellectually very challenged. So let me take I don't know, just a Hamlet third soliloquy, just for an example, and you know it. To be or not to be, that is the question, whether it is nobler than mine to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of trouble, and by opposing in them. I'm sorry to put you through Shakespeare, but you got to hear this. Without consonants, we are not so, you know, I'm not drunk. I really am not. There's so many aspects about articulation that we need to think about. Just to think about. You don't want to get hung up on just the articulations because we're using that as a tool to clarify our musicality. But there are four aspects of articulation that we should be conscious of. One is air speed, the speed of the air. One is the compression at impact. We're back to those plosives again. Uh, uh, it's a little explosion of compressed air behind the tongue. Another one is tongue placement. And that's incredibly interesting because the syllable ta is different from language to language. 
In French, it's way up in front, the, on the teeth. Fet, toujours. Sarcastic. <laughs> and uh, in Italian and Spanish, it's a little bit further back. In German, it's further back, near the ridge that we all have there. In English, it's at the ridge, tongue, today. And in Chinese, it's way up on the roof of the mouth, gong hun. This has nothing to do with language, but I think it's, I mean, with articulation, but it's very interesting and maybe you can think about it. Women speak faster than men. And I have these numbers written down and they're different in different books, but the book I read, it's this. In Italian and Spanish, women speak at 120 syllables a minute. Men speak at 105 syllables a minute. In French, women speak at 110 syllables a minute and men speak at 100 syllables a minute. It's that tongue going further back each time. In German, women speak 100 syllables a minute and men speak 85 syllables a minute. And in English, women speak 80 syllables a minute and men speak 65. Now, my question is, and we're certainly not going to discuss it here, but it's an interesting question. And it's, it's open for a lot of one-liners. Why do women speak faster? Very interesting question. I think I have an answer. I've never read any research on this, but the answer to me is obvious. And that is that the tuba is slower than a piccolo trumpet. The contrabassoon is slower than a oboe. And the contrabass is slower than a violin. So the, the voice moves more smoothly. And if you're a woman, you can just talk faster. And I've seen occasions where that's really obvious. Now, it's impossible to try to analyze all of these consonances and these difference in the syllable ta, 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 ka. And that's why some philologists think there's a hundred and others think there's a hundred and twenty. Because where do you draw the distinction? But we're going to talk about ta. First of all, we need a discussion on ta. Children grow up hearing their parents speak, and they have no trouble in learning to speak and say the ta, like we're used to it. And the Chinese would say the ka, and the French would say the ta. There's two kinds of ta. There's ta, which is an unvocalized plosive. Ah, there's da, which is the same plosive, but it's a vocalized plosive. Da, there's ka, ka, and ga, same one. Ga, there's pa, and there's ba. Well, of course, in playing a brass instrument, we can't start the sound first to make a vocalized plosive. It's interesting there are other consonances that really are not, have not been counted. In uh, Northeast Africa, some of the languages have very exotic consonances, like in Zulu, the X is this sound, and the Q is this sound. And I can't do that very well, but that's beside the point. That's another bit of trivia that's only interesting. But there is one, and this is where I need a tubist, if I can get one available. All right. But I, I can sing it also. Can we do ta on a brass instrument? Of course, the lips can't vibrate first, and then the articulation comes, like in language. 
Da. Da and ta are the same, except one is vocalized. Yes, we can. The first note will be a Pelosi with ta, but after the sound is going, we can go da 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 We're going to talk more about that later. We're almost ready for the um, first video, Steve. All right, this and this this video just ties in perfectly to what you're talking about now. So just let me say one thing is that all of these subtle differences and all of these possibilities of articulation and we wonder how we're going to do it is superfluous. We can't process that information. We have to hear it in our mind's ear. If you start thinking about it, it's not going to work. Is that Marcel there? That's Marcel there because you, you did mention about a minute ago you would like to have somebody to help you demonstrate this. So Marcel's Marcel's on standby. Yeah. You'd like to Marcel. Can you do this on a C? Just the second space C. Go ta 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 ta. Just that. <laughs> Do it. Ta da 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 da. So we have a, a clear tongue and a legato tongue. This is one example of how that can work either way. Enjoy this video. It's a little bit funny and it's very, very um, representative of what we have a tendency to do when we get over analytical. Afterwards, we'll have questions. Please give me questions. Very often, we become so conscious of function that we can't do anything. Everything gets tied up in the knots, and we forget to make music and worry about how to breathe, how to tongue, how to set our embouchures. But the next segment of this master class I think will show us how dangerous that is when we get too conscious of everything that we're doing. This is Shannon Linklater, and she's also from Canada. She's a horn player, and she's going to help us with an experiment today. One of the problems with brass playing, or violin playing, or piano playing, or even singing, is sometimes we get too analytical. We get so analytical that we start thinking about everything. And this happens particularly with breathing. We start thinking about everything. We take a breath. Okay, now where do I put my tongue? And and where do I put my tongue? And then I tongue. And, and and but I have to move the air, and so nothing works. Arnold Jacobs called it paralysis by analysis. So this is an, uh, a lesson that shows what can happen by thinking too much. This bowl, this bowl that Shannon has got in her hands is full of water. <laughs> and she's going to get up and walk with this water and why don't you just do that? Get up and walk over to them. All right, now please come back and sit down. All right, now I want you to think about what you did. You got up. What, how did you get up? Do you just get up straight or do you lean forward and do your arms stay the same? And, and do you, how do you avoid the water from, if you see the water slurping, do you adjust the bowl one way or the other? Please tell us exactly what's going on okay. when you get up to every detail. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to get up by shifting my weight into my legs. So I'm going to lean forward and put the weight into my legs with my arms 
out to compensate for the water. It's sloshing. Okay, I'm going to take a step by shifting my weight onto my right leg, lifting my left leg into the air. Oh! Oh! <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't work very well. <laughs> okay, I think that shows what we're trying to, sh to prove here. Oh. <laughs> I think that shows it. <laughs> I'm sorry about your expensive shoes. Oh, it's okay. And, but, uh, <laughs> You can buy a new pair of shoes in Japan. Yes. <laughs> but uh, that happens, especially in breathing, you know. Okay, I'm going to take a breath, and oh my God, it sounds bad. <laughs> I think that was a good lesson. Thank you very much. Well, that's, that was in Japan about uh, 12 years ago. Great. Uh, and things haven't changed much. We still overthink a lot, don't we? We do. I mean, we're going to talk about all kinds of things. Tongue placement and uh, double tonguing, triple tonguing, and so much information. If you try to process that all while you're playing, you're going to slosh water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. We've got some questions. Um, cool. So I'm going to ask the attendees to put them in the question box, but we still have some in the chat box, and that's also fine. It's not as easy to catch for me. Uh, so Steve Marcus in New York asked you on the statistics that you quoted. Um, are men placed at a disadvantage to women regarding multiple tonguing with a brass instrument? Well, that was more out of trivia and for fun that women talk too fast. But they do. They talk faster than men. That's a fact. And it's a higher instrument. I don't think when it comes to multiple tonguing, women have any advantage. That's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, and Derek uh, Fenstermacher, thanks again, Derek, for joining us. Wow, it's great to have you aboard on this team. Uh, Mr. Bobo, curious, how many languages do you speak? I know you have traveled the world, lived many places. I wish sometimes I could speak many languages myself. So the question is, how many languages can you speak? One, it's English. Um, I can speak a little bit of Dutch. I speak Dutch fairly, fairly well. A little bit of Italian, a little bit of Japanese, and a very little bit of Spanish. And I know how to order a beer in a lot of Slavic languages. And in Turkey. And in Greece. Well, I've got a question for you. As you travel the world, or have traveled and will be again soon, um, what, what are the three most important things that you need to know in 10 languages to say? <laughs> um, where's this concert hall? You know, you have to say that to the taxi driver. Um, what's the national drink here? And may I have one, please? <laughs> all right, wonderful. Um, all right, now... Um, Dr. Buddy Clements uh, asks you, you mentioned four components to articulation, airspeed, compression, tongue placement, and was there a fourth after that? Yeah. It's uh, the fourth one. I want to just read it because I... It's, uh, the resistance of the instrument. Because if you're playing a big tuba and you blow into it through, let's say it's a C tuba, it's 16 feet long, it's just going to go. There's no resistance. But if you push down all the valves, you've got nearly 32 feet of cylindrical tubing and it's going to push back at you. And it's a different function with all of that re resistance. You can compare on an F2 between a pedal, a pedal F and a G flat, or a C2 between a pedal C 
in a D flat, that resistance makes a huge difference in the way that we articulate. That's great. Um, before we get to We're going to talk we... about that a little later on. I have a, a lot of speaking that I'm going to do about that, moving the air, in, especially in the low register, on those low register fingerings. Wonderful. And um, before we get to the other question, Steve, yeah, I know you're in Chicago. I don't know why I said New York. <laughs> Steve Marcus in New York. He's in Chicago. <laughs> I'll get these right. Memorizing where all 173 of our um, registrants actually live. That's, that's the next step. And then pronouncing the names. All right. Wow, we've got some uh, good questions here. Um, Patrick Lugo from Miami has two questions for you. Do you recommend breath attacks to improve your attacks? I was going to talk about that later, too. Do I recommend it? Not so much, but some people do, and I do recommend it sometimes. Because if we have a lip that won't respond, and we're trying to get it to be responsive, to try attacks with only air is uh, maybe a good therapy. There are people, I know great musicians, who really do 90% of their playing with no tongue at all. But articulation is the focus of rhythm. And on that, those people who play that that hundredth of a second that discriminates the exact rhythm is missing. And perfect rhythm is really musical energy. So the people who don't use their tongue, I think are missing a lot of musical energy. We're gonna talk about that later too. Great, um, and uh, Patrick Lugo also asked, what do you recommend to improve articulation and tongue speed? I don't know. I mean, practice, you know, get the Coprosh or Arbin and see how fast you can get it. Everybody gets to a certain tempo and, and they have a very hard time passing that. And some people can go up to 146 or even 148 in 16th notes. They're faster than that. I'm not a real fast tonguer. But and when we get to speaking about double tonguing, uh, we should mention that. Because everybody has a limit to how fast they can single tongue. And all of us at some point are going to find that limit and need to double tongue. But let's do the questions first. The first thing I'm going to talk about after the questions is double tonguing. And the Brilliant. very question, I'm going to go further with the very question that you just asked. Wonderful. Um, so here's another one from uh, Jesus in Spain, I believe. I'm trying to remember everybody, everybody's location. I'll get the city next. Um, what, difference, what differences exist between articulation in solo playing and orchestral playing? I think none. You know, we all have to have a vocabulary of articulations. And what we need to do in a Mahler or a symphony or a Tchaikovsky symphony or a Prokofiev ballet may be different than what we use in uh, the Von Williams tuba concerto. But those things support each other. We need to develop that vocabulary of articulations so that we can deal with whatever we're going to encounter. I don't think there's one kind of orchestral uh, uh, articulations. Uh, there's not one kind of articulations for solo playing. That's great advice. <laughs> Thanks. Um, what is your advice? For, this is from Bob. Uh, what is your advice for developing a better, beautiful tone? I'll use enough air. You know, a lot of people get a pretty tone, but uh, we have to use enough air. It's an interesting thing about that. Uh, to play a high C, 
middle C on the piano, play our high C, tubists. And I assume most of the people in the audience are tubists. Uh, that takes about four liters of air per minute. One octave lower in the second space of the bass clef, that takes about eight liters of air per minute at the same dynamic. At the same dynamic, an octave lower, low C, that takes about 16 liters of air per minute. And pedal C takes about 32 liters of air per minute. So I've just proved to you something that every one of you already know. It takes more air to play in the low register. And frequently we try to play with not enough air. And I'm also going to discuss this coming up. We play with a not enough air. And so we get a, a um, frail tone, a weakish tone. And we have to give it the fuel that it needs. You know, we hear this in rock and roll because these bands, these million dollar bands, they have an electrical system that, you know, probably costs more, way more than a million dollars. You hear Pink Floyd with these speakers and they have a, a low C or maybe even a lower than the piano. And it hits you like a brick wall but they have the amperage and the voltage to make it go. With a weaker amplifier, it goes just like we do. And it's not a strong sound. I really advocate that we have to play with a strong centered sound, even in pianissimo. And that can be, developed by playing in the middle register with a strong, mighty sound and try and maintain that sound as we get into softer dynamics. The secret is using enough air. I hope right. I answered that question. Yeah, and Jarl, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing these names correctly, um, then is specifically asking about um, improving the sound in the high register which you pretty much already touched on. Yeah. I think moving from the middle register up to the high register, either chromatically or through scale or an arpeggio, or just flexibility exercises. La -ya -ya. That'll help develop the high register. Um, we have to go for it. The biggest problem in the high register that I see is people who say, oh my, that's a high note. And so they go, because they're afraid of it. We have to go for it. We have to go through it like we never missed it in our lives. And you may miss it, but you won't develop the strength to center those high notes unless you go for it every time it appears. That's great. Now we have a tuba size question. <laughs> Joaquin Hernandez asks, any reason why you used small tubas and some of the other colleagues in the orchestra? Well, I did that in the 60s and, and halfway through the 70s. Because the smaller tuba has a ratio of overtones where there's more energy in the sound. And I liked that. The bigger tubas have a lot of fundamental, but the energy in the sound is not as intense as a smaller tuba. Well, I use the smaller tuba. For example, when you play with the trombone section or the play with the brass section, you have that sizzling with the trombones and the trumpets and then the tuba and the tuba if the temper of the tuba is sort of like the rest of the brass instruments it sounds okay but if you have a great big six quarter c tuba it's bing 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 and, and i've been avoiding that but i finally i did compromise i found something that was a little bigger than the smaller ones that I used, but not as big as the big ones that some guys use. 
there's a tendency now internationally, I think of the tuba symphonic tubas backing away from the giant stuff or equipment. I have to be careful what I say because it, you know, we don't all agree. And that's what makes the world grow around. And um, by the same token, we have to play different instruments. You know, half the orchestra repertoire is for bass tuba and half the orchestra repertoire is for contrabass tuba. And then we have to choose which one we want. We have to choose what's going to sound best. And I would see the trumpet players come in with their, you know, G trumpets and E flat trumpets and even E natural trumpets and D trumpets and C trumpets. And I would see the advantage of that. That's why I had a G tuba made for me because that tuba sounds great you can really open up and play it hard and you're still fit inside the trombone section I don't know for example a Berlioz unison you can play with great intensity and still be inside the section if you have an F tuba you might play with great by the time you get that intensity you're covering up the trombones And that's a bad thing, right? <laughs> yeah, it depends on who you are. <laughs> All right, now we're going to go back into some specific articulation questions from John, John Cradler in Washington, D.C. Should... This is great. Pardon? This is great. Yeah. I like this. <laughs> I mean, we've got, we got you know, professional players, students of all levels, amateurs. We've got people in their 70s. Uh, Leo's 12. This is wonderful. I love this too. I'm just like, my heart is warm and I get goosebumps being online with all you guys and ladies. Uh, so John Cradler, here's the question. Should the strike point of the tongue change within the mouth depending on the register being played? That's a great question. And the answer is simply yes. When you're playing in the lower register, let's say a low F for example, which I'm going to talk about specifically in the next section. A low F, you, you do a ta, like a French or a German, ta, ta, no! It's not, it's not, it's, it's slow. I think if you tongue in the low register, you can tongue on your upper lip or even between your lips. And then I promise it'll work better. And the high register, you know, if you tongue way forward in your mouth, it's going to sound too plosive. But if you put the tongue way back in the mouth, it's going to be softer attacks. And that's a general rule. You know, it's every, it's different from everybody. Everybody has a different structure in their oral cavity, but you can experiment with that. If you're having, forget this information, forget it. But if you're having trouble in one register with tonguing, then maybe try in the low register further forward or in the high register further back. Great. I've always wanted I've always wanted to ask these questions myself. So, John, thanks for asking on our behalf. Um, Bob asks, now this is not about articulation. It's about your story, which is very important as well. Um, what is the story behind how you got to be invited on Johnny Carson's Tonight Show? Yeah. Uh, Johnny Carson's secretary called me up and asked me to be on the show. That's the story. <laughs> Reminds me of the last webinar. <laughs> Great. Uh, what were your feelings when, when you when you got that? What what was going through your mind and your emotions? You mean when I got to the studio and the show was on? No, when just when you got that call. Oh, I was excited. You know, I think I got the information you know, at the break of a rehearsal, and then we went back on stage, and I told all the guys I'm going to be on the Carson show. <laughs> That's great. I, was, I had been on it twice, and uh, they asked me for a third time, and I told them I had a uh, orchestra rehearsal, which I did. I have two really good friends 
who took studio jobs when there was a symphony orchestra rehearsal and the orchestra found out about it and fired them. So you don't want to do that. Yeah. Never, never lie to your orchestra. I think it was a good idea. Let's be honest. <laughs> but get that time off if you can. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. All right. So um, here we go. Brett Clark, greetings from Bakersfield. How do you recommend combining the skills of multiple tonguing in articulation exercises with the technical aspects of fingers? Ah, that's a good question, too. Because a lot of us you know, get our technique, or our tonguing technique, so we can move, but the fingers are not able to do that. Somehow or other, it's easier in single tonguing because we're limited in how fast we can go single tonguing. So you develop your single tongue as fast as you can get it and work on your double tongue so it works slow. So you have this uh, margin between the single so you can protect yourself but as far as fingering is concerned i uh, i've done myself and i've had a lot of students do it practice the fingering without blowing anything just body usually the vowels make noise so if you have Let's take, for example, uh, a, 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 a copra study. Do that with your fingers and listen to the sound. Unfortunately, everybody's vowels make a little bit of noise. And if you hear Probably you're fingering clearly. If you hear, probably your fingering is not rhythmic. Fingering has to be rhythmic and it's uh, very useful and very beneficial to slow the fingering down and to listen to the sound that you make when you play. Are you hearing in our case 16th notes or are you hearing raindrops? And another question about tubas. This is sort of dovetails in with what the questions were before. Uh, from Dave Topping in Seattle. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know what tubas makes and models. Did you play? And do you play? I don't play. I, I don't play anymore. I'm affiliated with the Eastman Company. And I, it's my opinion that they make extraordinarily good equipment. And uh, there's other tuba, tuba companies that make good equipment, but Eastman is maybe a, a, a better economic deal. Look into it. I think if you want to find tuba, you have to try as many as you can and make your own mind up. You know, I'm, I'm affiliated with Eastman, but um, it doesn't mean that everybody should play in Eastman. You know, I'm affiliated with Velati mouthpiece makers in Japan. That doesn't mean everybody should use a Velati. When you're working with equipment like that, it's your responsibility to go out and test drive these instruments and these this equipment mouthpieces. So what, what tubas did you play during your career with the LA Philharmonic and in your, your whole solo career? I was affiliated with Miraphone for a long time, and they were wonderful. They, they were very helpful in me making my dream tubas. You know, the G, the G tuba was a Miraphone, and they supplied the parts for my bass horn. If you know that, I have a giant French horn, and uh, they supplied the parts for my contrabass trumpet. Miraphone was wonderful to me. Plus, I got to go over to Europe at least once a year and sometimes more. So I was happy with them. But uh, 
you know, I, I started using other equipment and I decided that uh, it's time to move on. And I did. I played uh, um, BNS for a long, long time. And I, I went to East Germany before 1989. I bought this BNS tuba. And it was extraordinary, an F tuba. And that's the point where I started playing F equally frequently as the uh, C. And when I moved to Europe, I became connected with Yamaha. And because Yamaha was making extraordinary instruments, the, the big C's and, and the little F's, and all in between are tremendous. They're wonderful tubas. And I, I used those uh, until I retired from playing. And I wasn't affiliated with anybody. And then I, I ran into Eastman and I was looking for some kind of sponsor. And I was testing those tubas which I think are tremendous. They're, some of them are wonderful. And I decided to affiliate with them. Cool. And let's go. <laughs> Great. Uh, now talking about instruments, uh, Derek asks um, two questions. This is for the students, on behalf of the students. So thank you, Derek, for asking these. Um, in 2021, uh, now and moving forward, um, what what do you recommend for a student who will own only two tubas? You know, no G tuba, no chimbasso, no, yeah, you know. no, just two tubas. They're a student and they're going to go into the big bad world and, and take auditions, military bands, um, uh, uh, orchestras, whatever, university positions. What two tubas would you recommend as far as keys and sizes, like four quarter, five quarter, six quarter, F, E flat, C? <laughs> it's a hard question. It's a hard question. The five quarter C tubas seem to be very popular. I personally would settle on a four quarter. The F tubas, um, when you play F tuba, get an F tuba that sounds like an F tuba. Don't try to make it sound like a C, and then it's pointless. You know, the, the, I, I just I feel a little awkward recommending specific instruments. The new Eastman F tubas are extraordinary. I had a chance to test drive them a summer and a half ago. It was wonderful. The Miraf of the Miraphone also, by the way, but the Yamaha F tubas are also wonderful. There's a lot of things you have to do when you are working out what it's going to take to choose these instruments. And they're all good. You know, when I was a young boy, uh, 18 or 19, 20 years old, there was Miraphone. And that's what there was. So naturally, I, I got affiliated with them. And what they were making was good. And, and today, it's still good. And I hear very, very fine friends of mine you know, playing on the Miraphone. And it sounds absolutely wonderful. I have a friend who plays with the Bomberg Symphony named Heiko Trivener. He's superb. And it's a beautiful sounding tuba. There's a guy named, what is it? I can't ever remember his name. He's from somewhere in Scandinavia. Is it or Orsten? Orson? Oyston. Oyston. I think he plays a miraphone too. <laughs> Never heard of him. Just kidding. <laughs> Yeah, and E flat. Yeah, and an E flat. Wow, it's very cool. You know, if I were starting over again, I might very well start on E flat. I mean, that's just my my inclination is to stretch out. I have a D. I had a D tuba. It was wonderful for certain pieces. 
but you know that was me and i was trying to do what the trumpet players did when i'd go on tour the stage crew took great exception that i wanted to take three tubas <laughs> however however i want to say we took three tubas great yeah whenever i tour i tell the uh, orchestra manager yeah i need two tubas and they try to negotiate <laughs> they say, well it's going to cost more and more paperwork for the customs and the moving around of the tuba and i said is this a tour for artistic reasons or for practical reasons <laughs> yeah, and maybe you didn't said, okay okay point taken <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I actually i took three you know when, when the g tuba was right it was really right fantastic now, speaking of tuba sizes, Derek asks another question here about students. Um, and this is, this is what he puts in the question box. I find a lot of students want to sound like an orchestral musician with a larger than life sound before they win the job. But I know there's also an opinion towards using smaller equipment for the audition. Well, that's what I said. There's a, seems to be a trend to coming down a little bit in tuba size. In, in auditions, the committees are not used to hearing somebody who's going to easily cover up the whole orchestra. And if there's any advantage to that big equipment, it's for really, really loud playing. And uh, I think a, a tuba with a, a finer center, a more uh, intense center, is going to serve you better than a big tuba. But this is so personal. This is so personal. I Maybe mean, half the guys listening to this broadcast are thinking, you know, the Yamaha six quarter, Yama York six quarter, that's the tuba I want. You know, and if you've got $35,000, go for it, but you may not win the audition. Um, back to articulation, Igor Martinez. Hi, Igor. Um, always with us, Igor, uh, for Venezuela. Maestro, cheers from Venezuela. What do you recommend for explaining, developing, and improving articulation with kids on a beginner level? Hmm. Have them sing songs using brass articulations, maybe songs that are children's songs in their neighborhoods and have it uh, have them do that sort of the uh what's the violin technique uh, i can't remember the word the japanese violin school the, the suzuki school hey yes the suzuki school you know almost start the kids like that so they can go have them sing it together. That's a start. I'm not an expert on that, but that's my answer to your question. Great. Well, that wraps up Q&A number one. We've got two more to go, and we're already one hour into this webinar, so we're, we're getting a lot done. This is great. Uh, so, Mr. Bobo, we're going to... Yes. You're going to talk to us now about multiple tonguing. Yeah. Um, as I said, there's a lot of places to put the tongue for a ta. But now you've got that other plosive where you have the ka. And for the first time, you're using ka when you're playing. It's always a good idea for something like double tonguing to move it up as far forward in the mouth as possible and start playing simple things better yet start on just ka and play a scale and get that ka so that it functions and i was even thinking one time that i was going to write uh, multiple tonguing book and then I looked at Arvin's book and it's fantastic there's no way that I could write a better multiple tonguing book than 
Arvin. But there's one thing that I think is very important where I would disagree. And that is in his book, he puts triple tonguing first and has, I don't know, 14 or 16 pages of triple tonguing exercises. And then whoever asked me the question about vowel movement, it's good to do that. You get the tonguing work. And then on page 14, 15, and 16, he's got where you have to use your vowels. But that's another question right now. Get the double tonguing stabilized because it's we can lose it when we're double tonguing or multiple tonguing. So practice it. I don't want to set myself up as an example, but I want to tell you a story. I was driving from Los Angeles to Rochester, and my first leg of the journey was from Los Angeles to Albuquerque, New Mexico. So I made the decision that I was going to do multiple tonguing exercises from LA to Albuquerque, which I don't remember how long it take. took. 15 hours, 13 hours, something like that. And, you know, I would do it. I, I really did it almost all the way. Dun, da -ka, da -ka, da -ka, dun, da -ka, dun, just simple things, not too fast. Get the tongue stabilized. And then I would move to triple. And the triple tongue, the reason I said double, start with double is the triple tongue can get unstable easily. And, and it gets off. But if you start with the double and get those stabilized and start with the triple slowly, you can get it so that it's pretty much stable. Follow the urban method for multiple tonguing. It is great. He's a genius in that. I have some beginning kids, and I, and I put them on the Arvin book for at the very beginning. And even the way he introduces basic functions are fantastic. I couldn't do better anyway. I couldn't, in, in no way could I do better. And even I would start to get into quintuple tonguing. There's a coprosh exercise. Dun, taka taka ta dun, taka ta taka dun, taka ta taka dun. Quintuplets, or you can do it the other way around. Dun, da 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 dun, or you can do going back and forth. Dun, da 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 dun, da 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 dun, da 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 dun, da 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 dun, da 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 dun. Get all those disciplines so they work for you. I think in multiple tonguing, if you sing that like a child would in a, with the Suzuki method, you know, you, you sing dun, da, 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 the same way with the adults. Get the double tonguing stable, move to, to triple tonguing, and then give yourself some challenges. Seven or that kind of thing. And especially for tuba, I want to talk about. Uh, interesting thing to me. I, I love the Hummel trumpet concerto. Maybe you know it. And it's a certainly at a, a double tonguing speed. Well, that's trumpet. And that kind of staccato double tongue really sounds good on trumpet, especially uh, I think on the on the Hummel. They usually play it on an E flat, so it's a little trumpet. And especially on the piccolo, you know. But on tuba and even trombone and horn, to play that kind of staccato 
sometimes loses his elegance. For example, on tuba, if I were to play that, I would play. Etc. I think it sounds better than. I had one teacher who kept telling me frequently, don't play trumpet, you play tuba. I guess that made an impression on me. Try those different things. You know, try it with daga daga da and try it with taka taka ta. Daga taka taka ta in the low register. Taka 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 ta. Sounds really good for styles. If you're playing in a Polish polka band or a, an Austrian umpapa band, then it's charming. But uh, sometimes double tonguing in the low uh, on a tuba in that tessitura of music can uh, sound old fashioned that's the way double tonguing was done on tuba when i was a boy i would notice that when i was 13 14 15 you have a choice and that's what's the wonderful thing. I'm not saying it should be any way. I'm saying try it both ways or in between and make your decision. But finally, the articulation is the fine tuning of rhythm. You know, you've got, this is articulation. This is articulation. This is articulation. This is rhythm. That hundredth of a second of sound envelope where the note begins, bang, that has to be on time, especially when you're playing with other people. We'll talk about that later too. Articulation is the focus of rhythm. Articulation is the fine tuning of rhythm. I'm ready to move on. Okay, if shall I? You want me to continue, Steve, or shall we stop? And take a, uh, take well, a we've, got, we've got just a couple questions here, so why don't I take these two questions and then we'll okay. move? Okay, fine, fine. Um, one is being translated as we speak. So, and and everybody, speaking of translations, um, quick announcement: next week at this time, I will be giving a webinar in Spanish and English with Igor Martinez translating everything. And I am gonna be specifically working with uh, South American tuba students from Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador. You're all welcome to join. Um, so this will be uh, you know, for, for our Spanish speaking friends, but, but this is an open webinar. So you, you're all welcome to come and observe and ask questions as well. So we are having a question from Julie in um, Julie in Argentina being translated. In the meantime, here's a, a question, a little bit related to three miniatures because there's a lot of tonguing. Um, uh, is there, hello, Maestro Roger? Is there a great interesting story behind the piece Three Miniatures? Uh, well, I have some ideas about it. My ideas formulated after I made the recording. So how I would do it now is different than I would did it on the recording. For example, the, the second of the first movement. Well, that's that's fast. But then we have this section. And with all this sewing machine movement, the music, music that some of the old people called it, because it sounds mechanized. You, suddenly you have this bum, da dum, da dum, da dum. And if you play the piano, playing the sewing, sewing machine music, the mechanism, and you play 
It's a very nice contrast. The only other thing I think is uh, in the last movement. Well, on the last four notes, I changed to single tongue, and that gave me just the right kind of retard. That's it's a good piece. That's a really good piece. Fantastic piece. Now uh, I have the uh, uh, Igor has translated a question from Yuli. So thank you, Igor. Um, hello, Maestro. Um, uh, Yuli is. I'm gonna try to remember Yuli. You're 14, 15 years old, something like that. A wonderful, talented young lady in Argentina. She asks. Um, is there any exercises that you would recommend for start to work on articulation? Well, I think Arvin is great. I think Arvin is really great. You know, the, the exercises in Arvin, you can thumb through the first 50 pages and you'll find something that is just right for you. You'll find something you can play. Right. I, I don't, that's what I would recommend as a teacher. If, if you were studying with me and you, you wanted just to start working on articulation, I think I'd put you in Arvin. I'd change you as soon as possible to Koprash. I think that there are three styles that we need to keep going. One is the development of technique. Then to wit, Koprash. One is to develop espressivo legato playing, which is Borgodni. And one is to develop orchestral playing, which is Blazevich. And I see Blazevich etudes as orchestral passages. A lot of people, rather than working for two or three years on the orchestral passages, would be a lot better off if they just learned new Blazevich exercises every day and learn those and play them orchestral as an orchestral passage, play them symphonic style. And actually, I want to point out, there are two Blazevich books, book one and book two. Most people never even get book two. They're great. Get book two. Roger Bobo's tips of the webinar, get book to Blazevich. Uh, now moving on with the questions. Um, welcome, uh, Ophelia and Franz. Welcome, and thank you for joining us at ridiculous o'clock in the morning for you. Uh, she will be translating the first French-English webinar on Tubamani Tuesday coming up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with mm -hmm. Francois Toulier. So that'll be great. But anyway, her question is, I have a question about playing both instruments, F tuba and sax horn, because she is becoming a sax horn specialist. Is it a realistic goal or is it too ambitious? Oh, certainly, certainly. I know there are a lot of people who play uh, euphonium and tuba equally well, and the sax horn would be in that category as far as tessitura is concerned as euphonium. And they play, there's, there's people who play them both incredibly wonderful. And as far as changing from instrument to instrument, I want to point out that there's a Mexican guy by the name of Faustino Diaz. He is a great tuba player. And he can go out on stage and play a Vaughn Williams with an orchestra, and it's wonderful. And he gets the applause that he deserves. And he comes out and plays the first movement of the... Haydn trumpet concerto on a trumpet for his encore. He sounds great on trumpet, euphonium. He played first trombone in the Zurich Opera for a while, and he sounds great on tuba. So if you hear people say that's absurd, nobody can do all that, forget it. They can't. All right, and we've got um, oh, yes. Uh, 
Tom Kindred says, I've had some lessons with a few of your students. They always refer to your beer breath and whiskey breath. I would like to hear this. <laughs> hear about that. Well, it's a joke. You know, it's a, sometimes you're playing beam, bum, bum, bum. Well, that's a beer breath. Uh, but if you're playing that's a whiskey breath doesn't have to be a big you're just popping off the tent but that's just a sort of fun vernacular to make a light moment in the class one of them is a big luxury breath where you feel if i breathe uh, the evaporation of the air on your mucous membrane all the way down. A luxury breath. And one of them is a breath where you, you don't have time for a big, deep luxury breath, but you need a sip to top off the tank so you can make it through to the end of the phrase. Great. We do have some more questions, um, but let's save that for our final Q&A. We've got our three students lined up for you now. Ready for this section three? Okay. And uh, one thing I want to say to the Let's attendees, talk. Uh, Miss, Mr. Bobo, before we go on, there's, there's one thing that I did suggest to the attendees in an email I sent out to everybody on Tuba Media Tuesday, was please, if you've got your tuba, as I do, Join. Everybody on this webinar can join this. You play along with us. Uh, so whether you're attending live now or viewing this as a recording, go ahead and, 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 and play along with us. All right. So go on. Well, I was thinking that we need to talk about a really soft attack and the New World Symphony with that chorale, with our famous 14 notes one group of seven and one group of seven at the end that uh, they have to be good so how do we how do we guarantee that that attack is going to be beautiful because we don't want a closing of sound on that attack. we don't need uh, so and of course we can't do a non closing we can't go and, uh, that won't work. How do we do it? And I think the safest thing is to say, first of all, you get them as close to a soft tongue as possible. So that the air can become some of the same. That coordination is going to get them working. And the other thing to guarantee that. And in most music, I really advocate rhythmic breathing. So the New World Symphonies in four, think one, two, three. Ba and I think if you can breathe on that upbeat, you're going to be very safe. The, all, the, all the tuba players there now, visible. Let's try an F major chord with a soft tone. And I'm going to give you three. Wait, can you see me? See, yes. Oh, yeah, on my screen, I can't see myself. Never mind, we see you. We see you well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Play, uh, Marcel? Play an F. You have to pull it a little bit. You sound like you have the mic in your belt. And uh, Leo, play a C. Where did she go? Ah, Rachel, you play an A. Bye. 
If you want to join in, Steve, you can play a low F. We'll make it hard. And I'm going to count one, two, three. Take a breath through four. And don't, a lot of people at the top of the breath close their throat. They call it the cough mu mu muscle. <laughs> but the air goes in, doesn't stop, it just changes direction. Breathe through the fourth beat. Here we go. One, two, three. <laughs> Well, that's pretty good, and it's a lot of sound for uh, the internet right this minute, at least in my end of it. Let's do it again. Make the softest, softest tongue that you can do. Air and tongue start at the same time without closing. One, two, three. <laughs> It's important that you remember this, that breathing is part of the music. Taking that breath sets you up physiologically to make a beautiful attack. And it also sets you up rhythmically. Your music's already going in your mind. The breath is part of the music. It's an important, very important part of making secure these soft attacks. Yeah. It's difficult with conductors sometimes because they're so intent on it being a soft attack without a plosive. They want the sound to come out of nowhere. They give beats like this. And, you know, we don't know where to come in. And uh, either you've been a section that's played together 10 years or 31 years or uh, it's likely not to be together. Or, you know, you can decide, okay, when the baton reaches the third button down, we'll come in. Well, that's a joke. But uh, you've got to be together on these things. And sometimes the conductor uh, isn't aware how important that upbeat is. I've had discussions with conductors Give us an upbeat. And he says, yeah, but then you're going to make a close of it. Well, we need the upbeat. I'd like to do something else now. Rachel, can you play the opening of the second movement of the Vaughn Williams? Just the first bar? Okay. That's very nice after the first hundredth of a second. Where it went sput fut bong. <laughs> now, how can you fix that? You come in on the second beat. Make the first beat part of the music and set your body up physiologically and your uh, movement. Your, your musical movement up. For you, the music starts on the first beat. So watch this. You don't play, just watch me. Three. Try that and see if it, if it goes right. I'll start the measure before that. Two. Yeah, that's pretty good. Do it again and see if you can make it even a softer attack. I still heard a plosive. Two, three. Yeah, 
this. Yeah, that, that, that last one was, each one was way better than the one before. That can help you in a lot of music. Now, I don't know if you know the Brute, Brute Lawton Sonatina, or the, you know, nobody can decide if it's a concertina or a sonatina. But anyway, the second movement starts on the B flat, and it's one, two, three. Ba, da, da. One, two, three. Ba, da, 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 da. It's a real easy passage. It's a B flat chord. But it comes in on the end of three. And that, for some reason, is a lot harder. Rarely do we hear anybody miss the, the first notes of the Romanza in the Vaughn Williams Concerto. But this da, 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 is frequent. So if you give yourself a whole deep breath, like you did to the Vaughn Williams, it'll work. The whole deep breath has to be on the end of two. So watch me. One and two. Da, 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 dee. Do it with me without playing. Just breathe with me and go da on the end of three. One and two. Da, da. Yeah. yeah, well, we're not going to be together because uh, um, the cyber job doesn't allow that. Yeah. But I'm thinking rhythmically, you're not going to be with me. We just get used to that. Let's do that again and don't pay any attention to me. Two, three, one. Da, 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 da. Yeah. I would say to you, don't gasp. Take a big, beautiful, luxurious breath. Take your time. Make the pipe is open all the way down. See if you can feel that evaporation down to here. You take the breath with me for the one way. Breathing on one. Two, three. That's too fast. That's too fast. Take your time. Breathe in slow. I hear this rushing sound of air friction. You've got a whole beat. Listen. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try to imitate you. I'm going to try to do it right and imitate you. Two, three. Da, da, dee, dee, dee. Da, da, dee, dee, dee. I'll do this with you. <laughs> it's a gasp. Gasp of Again. Von Williams. The Von Williams breath. Just the breath? Just the yeah, I mean do something on two. Say ba. Okay. Two, three. Ba. Hey, that's right. That's right. I think it uh, you'll get a much better result that way. Now do the B flat arpeggio coming in on the end of three, which means you will breathe on the end of two. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you the same problem, except you breathe on the end of two. Four, one, two. That's fine. I think you took the right amount of air in, but two things. There, we could hear the sound of air friction, probably at your lips, and your lips were so close, close to the mouthpiece that we could hear that sound coming out the bell. Mm -hmm. And it's not, you don't want that on your CD. Yeah. Or you don't want that when you compete in an international competition. Uh, you know, it's, it sounds, you know what it sounds like? I, I don't want to be gross. And it's very similar to a toilet flushing. All right, see if you can do a silent one. Four, one, two. 
That's perfect. That was just wonderful. Would you like to try that, Leo? Did you follow what we did? I don't think he hears me. Marcel, could, do you understand? Oh. Yeah, I'll give it a try. Leo, okay. we got Leo. Fine. Well, Leo can do All it. All right, Leo, we'll go. Come in on the end of two. Three, one, two. Yeah, was that a really deep breath? I didn't see anything expanding and, you know, take the biggest, deepest, most luxurious breath that you can take. Four, one, two. Fine, let's try it. Or so. Four, one, two. Well, I heard the sound coming out the bell. You know, we don't want to hear any air friction sounds of any okay. kind. Okay. So maybe back away another, I don't know, a couple of millimeters or a quarter of an inch from the mouthpiece. We won't hear that sound. Then have everything open enough so that the air comes in in that luxurious way. Four, one, two. Sure, that's a lot better. Let's go on. Now, probably all of you know Mahler First Symphony because it's, you know, it's in all the orchestra excerpts, you've been playing. But there's another note that I think is even more strategic than that solo, and it's a low F that starts in the first movement where you have the third of the chord and it's just a gorgeous moment in all music it's one of my favorite moments the tuba has to come in in a low f it's marked pianissimo now you heard me talk before about some people play pianissimos without enough velocity of air to give it the fuel that it's going to be a centered stable note. Without enough air, it sounds um, a little anemic, a little, what's the right word? Unhealthy. Uh, it's because there's not enough air. Well, you know, I think I said on the top C, takes four liters of air a minute. On the next C down, second space, it takes eight liters of air per minute at the same dynamic. The low C takes 16 liters of air per minute, and the pedal C takes 32 liters of air per minute. Okay, what does it mean for an F? I don't know, maybe 24 liters of air per minute? But you got to give it, and you can't ease into it. Of course, I can't sing a low F, but I'm going to sing some note. And almost all the time, this note sounds, you come to this magical place, and you hear, and it takes a quarter or a third of a second for the note to stabilize. There's two things. You're not using enough air and the air has to start on time. So if you're thinking this is air, huh? you take a breath and you're gonna be using 24 liters of air per minute, even in piano. You know, this note in piano is going to take as much air as an octave higher in fortissimo. It takes a lot of air. 
there is nothing that I know of in human action that compares to playing tuba in the low register. There's nothing. I don't know of anything else that's like it. You have to take massive breaths of air and you have to move it suddenly with force. It takes force, it takes strength, and it has to be elegant and delicate. That's a trick, but it's possible. Who wants to play a low F? Volunteer. Okay, you got it. Go. Let's just in a nice breath and start a low F and have it be stable, supported, and on time. So we'll do it on one, two, three. Yeah. I think that the air, the, I don't want to say impact because it's not an impact, but it's subito. You take the breath and it's time for the F. The air moves quickly. It's not a delicate function. But the thing is to coordinate that sudden swift move, swift movement of air with the start of the note. And then uh, I would say I would do it, tonguing it very gently on my upper lip. If the big impact of air, the big wave of air starts on time and you touch your lip slightly, it might be good. It's going to be different from everybody. Maybe it's not your lip. Maybe it's between the lips. Maybe it's on your upper teeth. You have to figure it out for yourself. It's certainly not the same for everybody. Two, three. Well, that's just, uh, that's in the uh, sonic place that doesn't work okay. well on the internet. I hear more distortion than note. Do it again. See if you can get it to start even. That was, a, I think, basically that's a good drum quality. Two, three. Ah, uh, sorry. Could I give it one more go? See, that's what I mean. You know, you don't know. Not Well, there we go. Uh, Mr. Bobo and I were just talking about the internet in Mexico, and we uh, we knew this might happen. He'll be he'll be right back on. We'll just we'll just wait. Um, I do have some. Um, I do have some backup plans here while we're waiting. I was going to save this for the end. Um, if the three of you could mute yourselves, the three students. Uh, while we're waiting for Mr. Bobo, I've got um, his Hindemith Sonata with the music written out where we can hear all of the articulation. So we'll, we'll listen to this until he comes back. Oops.
Hey, we were just listening to you play Hindemith while we were waiting for you to come back. Well, I heard the Hindemith, but I, I guess I'm assuming you can hear me now. Well, yeah, yeah, loud and clear. So we can continue. I, <laughs> I think I was doing everything right. Well, some, you know, internet gremlins. So uh, where were we? About getting that low F to sound on time with this tidal wave of air. It takes power and strength and action to get that note to sound, and it has to sound elegant and delicate. It's a challenge. Sometimes it's an advantage to have more resistance to play a low note. So though that with that big C tuba that you have, Marcel, it's maybe more touchy than it would be for Rochelle, who has a, an E flat. And the, the F on an E-flat tuba has a lot of resistance because it's going through all this cylindrical tubing. E-flat tuba, let's say it's 14 feet long. You add that to you, you've got a 20-foot tuba when you've got your uh, low F fingering going. So play a low F for us. And play it with enough strength that it's stable and on time and beautiful. Rochelle? Yeah. Oh, Rachel. Okay, here we go. Sorry, I'm just on two, two, three. Well, that's the stable sound. I think that was a stable sound. I think that would be a very pr appropriate sound for that place in the... Uh, Mahler first, which is our first note, by the way. But you had a big air leak before any sound came out of it. Yeah. See if you can temper that. See if you can make it work to the thousandth of a second. Mm -hmm. Three. Well, you know, the sound is just evaporating. It sounds like you're playing into a fast moving fan and it's splitting apart. It's not your fault. I think it's a good sound, I think. <laughs> but you still had a rush of air before the sound came. Mm -hmm. So there's two ways that you can work on that. One way is to practice without a tongue and seeing if you can get so you can get a note started do it rhythmically all these things that are sort of therapeutic put a rhythm to them so that the discipline of rhythm exists even if it's a note. and secondly the second therapy is uh a second therapy is impact boom boom Boom, boom. So first of all, I want you to play five really hard hit low Fs. More like you would play in Romeo and Juliet. Boom, 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 boom. You know that passage? Mm -hmm. All right, hit, hit it. Do five of them. Mm -hmm. Really accented low Fs. Okay, now the good news is you got a good sound down there. The bad news is bending, and I think it, it never had impact. My friend Tommy Johnson used to be able to play in that register and sound like Maynard Ferguson playing in Stan Kenton's band hitting a high C. It was such impact, it was shocking. It scared me to death and uh, showed me a new direction that I needed to go. I never did get it like he had it, but he had a gift for that. Now do the, without the tongue, long notes. Do four half notes without the tongue. 
That's pretty good. I'll try it again softer. You know, it is pianissimo. But the thing that's wrong with that note all the time is people are trying to obediently play pianissimo under the dynamic that, uh, I mean, under the tone quality that's stable. Maestro, you know, I've, I've, Maestro I've just got to give you a little reminder. We've got about five minutes left. Well, that's, I'm at the end of the... That's where I was ended. Great. I'm just just checking in. Just yep, just checking in. Keep going. Well, I think the impacts did you good. And uh, hit that note now and see it. Let it diminuendo. Loud and then diminuendo. Well, not loud. Mezzo. Okay. And then diminuendo. Okay. Yeah, I think that's another good therapy. But impact therapy is not what people naturally do, but sometimes it really helps. Just pound on that note for a while. Mm -hmm. I mean, put a pattern to it. Bad choice of words. Just play very loud that note and accent it a few times. I wanted to wrap up mostly by saying I, I enjoyed this very much. And... Uh, you know, how do you uh, uh, prove this big vocabulary of of uh, articulations? And the only way to do that is to listen. Listen to music. Whether or not you're concentrating as a learning mechanism or whether or not you're doing the dishes and have music going on, it's still going into the computer. And when it comes time that you're sitting in a context with other musicians and something's coming up, you may just know. We adjust to the musical experience by listening and by performing, especially by listening. Listening is the key and your principal teacher is yourself. You've got Steve as a great guide, but I'm okay, I'm a good guide. I'm also a good guy, but a good guide. And you, you are the one who says, okay, do it this way, now do this. Experiment, do a little less of this and a little more of that. Try to balance that rush of air with a soft tongue. The low register is redundant as you collect all the necessary techniques on tuba to get things working. You'll find that the low register is slower to develop than the other aspects. Don't get discouraged. It just comes slower. Thank you all. I think you've, you've been very tolerant. Well, on behalf of the students, Maestro, thank you very much. We still have a couple questions in the, oh, good, good. In the questions box. We do have we do have five minutes left. Now, I was playing your Hindemith Sonata. I selected this on purpose because you display a lot of different styles of articulation through that and some beautiful legato passages. So with your permission, we will close the webinar with your Hindemith Sonata. Okay. And uh, we've already heard a bit of it, but we'll, we'll play it back from the beginning as well so we get the context. We've got one more question here um, from Austria in Italy. Um, oh, two questions. Okay, here we go. Uh, I would like to ask you how to deal with the change in embouchure of the high register that compromises the sound and articulation. From where in Italy? Uh, 
just Italy. Oscar, where are you in Italy? Let us know in the chat box where you are while, Mr. while Maestro is answering your question. So, uh, Maestro, how would how would you um, deal with the changes of embouchure in the high register that compromises sound and articulation? I would move from the middle register to the high register, and you'll find a way. You know, I, I really hesitate to say do this to get a high register because it might come out the wrong way. When you go up, go up and move around a little bit and then come back down so that the high register doesn't sound like some kind of special effect that you do sometimes. Do flexibility exercises that go up there and move you. That kind of exercise. And if you don't know what they had to do on your own, I can help you. You know, they're, they're in here. I didn't put a lot of those things in there because I think that probably after you see how they work and what they're for, you probably find your own exercises. The first edition was that thick of repeated stuff. So I, I think this is a much better book, this thick. Great. And speaking of your book, which I would highly recommend everybody to consider purchasing, um, are you available for online private lessons? Absolutely. Absolutely. And for the attendees who are attending live or will be viewing the recording later, what is the best way to contact you for lessons? Uh, you can contact me on Messenger or email. And Steve has the address. My email address is, what is my email address? bowmaestro.com at gmail. A bow maestro at gmail.com. Yeah, I'm going to put it in the chat Bo box. Maestro. Okay. And uh, or you know, go on uh, uh, Facebook Messenger because I check both of those things every day. It gets strange when they come in on one, another than those two. Sometimes I've even lost some students because they wrote me in a different mode and I didn't get it. Great, wonderful. And we've got one more question. And if anybody has any other questions, please email it to us because we're about to run out of time. Um, do you have any mouthpiece recommendations from that part? For what? The question C -tuba, is, F -tuba. I guess any tuba. I have to be very careful. Of course, I love Volari. It's a Japanese mouthpiece. It's, it's great. But my my dear friend, um, Ro um, uh, Mike Roy, uh, what's it? What's Mike's name? Mike in Boston. Yeah, Mike, Mike, Mike Rowlands in Boston. He has his mouthpiece too. You know, and we know certainly without question it's going to sound good. You have to go out and try them. You know, you're all in Sydney, right? All three of you and. You know, everybody must have a shop near them that carries mouthpieces. Valari is not available all over in every shop in the world yet. In Japan and America, they're getting there. But you can't wait for that. Go out and find a place that has as many as possible and try them and see which one you like the best. That's the only way. What you like the best, take people with you. Get it down to two mouthpieces. You know, eliminate the, the other three if it's five. Get it down to two mouthpieces and then A, B, the two mouthpieces with you have friends listening to it. 
and listen to what they say and let play again having heard what, what they say and see if you see hear the same things and then make up your own mind and get the one you like i cannot and i don't, I don't think anybody should recommend a specific mouthpiece maybe Valari F tuba mouthpiece might work well for a big percentage, but maybe not. Maybe in Japan it works well. Maybe in Germany it works well, but you know, maybe in Australia you're looking for a different kind of sound. There's no right or wrong here. It's what you like, it's what fix, fits into the kind of music that you play most of the time. Ooh. That's great. Great advice, and um, just some, some thank yous here as we close off from uh, Dr. Buddy Clements. Absolutely fantastic symposium today. Thank you so much, Maestro. You are a superhero to all musicians. Also, Steve, thank you thank very you, much. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> um, great, so um, all of you who attended, I look forward to meeting with you here um, in future webinars. We do have at this time, we have coming up people like Honda Caesar, Craig Knox, Alan Bear, etc., myself, and on Tuba Mania Tuesday, we've got Francois from France, and boy, the list is going to go on. A lot of people coming back. I'm not going to bore you with all that now because you can go to the website. Um, but what I want to also mention to all the attendees is that please feel free to reach out to me individually. I'm happy to. Uh, I'll talk with you on Facebook or on Zoom to, to see where you are and uh, just have a chat with friends. If there's um, any help in your part of the world that you would like help with, I'm, I'm here for you because this is a COVID thing is still going on. This is sort of my gift to the world. So, Steve, you're doing a wonderful job. It's just fantastic what you're doing. Thank you. And yeah, you know, like I said, I couldn't be doing this without the attendees and Maestro Bobo today. So without further ado, we will close off and say goodbye. And we are going to listen to this, the whole Hindemith Sonata. So if you've got 10 minutes Whoa. to turn around, we're going to listen to this whole thing. Here we go. And thank you for joining. <laughs>
Thank you.